reducing hay waste. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Krishona Martinson, and Dr. Martinson received her BS from the University of Wisconsin River Falls and her master's and PhD from the University of Minnesota. She has worked for the University of Minnesota since 2001 and is currently the equine extension specialist in the animal science department. Her specializations include pasture management, weed control, poisonous plants, and forage utilization, and her research focuses on optimizing equine forage utilization. Please note, if you haven't seen already, that you are able to ask questions during the presentation using the text chat to the left of your screen, and we will also have time at the end of the presentation for additional questions. Our presentation tonight will be recorded and uploaded to our website if you would like to review it at a later time. And at this time, I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to Dr. Martinson. All right, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I really uh, appreciate all of you taking time out of your evening to to listen to this webinar. I think, um, you know, I think maybe in the past, uh, hay prices have not been as high going into winter, so people were maybe not as concerned about reducing hay waste. But in the last um, several months, it's become very apparent to many people uh, that because of some pretty widespread weather events, um, the high fuel prices, and other things, that uh, the price of hay is going to likely be significantly more um, this fall heading into winter than it has been in the past. So I think this topic of reducing hay waste is um, is quite timely, uh, given the current state of our of our hay crop. So just to really briefly kind of outline what I'm going to talk about, I'll give a brief introduction, and then I want to talk about you know buying quality hay. Reducing your waste starts at, with buying. Um, also, the biggest place that people tend to experience hay waste is during the storage and feeding process. So we'll talk about proper storage and then talk about feeding. And um, we'll spend a lot of, quite a bit of time highlighting some research we recently did at the University of Minnesota um, looking at picking round bale feeders. And again, I just encourage you guys to ask any questions, type them in the chat, and I'll try to keep up with you. In all honesty, I try to keep the presentation short so that I would have plenty of time um, to answer questions. So feel free to answer or to ask questions at any point. So I think you all probably realize that forage represents a significant portion of the diet for all classes of post wean horses. So basically anything that's a foal and older. When we look at diets, we would like to see you know, 100% forages. Of course, dried hay and even grass pasture to some extent will never complete all of the horse's vitamin and mineral needs, but certainly energy needs if it's good quality hay and pasture. At an absolute minimum, we want to see half of their diet in, in forage. And of course, that's a, that's a pretty specialized group of horses, the intense, um, you know, elite equine athlete that needs, you know, that little bit of forage. Um, but most horses that we work with, most people that own horses, their horses can, can do very, very well on 75% to 100% hay plus a ration balancer to fill in those gaps in the vitamin and, and, and minerals. And as we also look across our horse owning expenses, if we look look at it, you know, buying hay, especially if you live in the upper Midwest, where for six months out of the year you, you do not have pasture and you have to rely on dried forage or hay, you know, this is a very expensive component of of um, caring for your horse. And of course, to try to alleviate some of those expenses, we really want to dig deeper into how more efficiently select, store, and feed your hay. So honestly, it all starts with buying quality hay. When we have looked across horse owners, we know that most horse owners buy some or all of their hay. And of course, some horse owners bale or make a component of their hay. Um, and whether you are making your own hay or buying hay, there's really these um, seven things that you really need to keep in mind. The first thing is moisture content. It is really, really important. Horses, unlike other livestock, like beef cattle, for example, they are incredibly sensitive to mold. If you look at, at forage standing out in the field, 
it is about 85% moisture. The ideal moisture for horse hay is between 10 and 15%. We want to shoot for 15%. So think about all that goes into it. That hay has to dry from 85% down to 15% moisture. So we want to make sure that that moisture content is 15%. Now, sometimes you can kind of edge it up with your small square bales to 17%, but we know that anything over 18% moisture has a very high likelihood of molding. So how do we know what the moisture content of the hay is? If you're baling the hay, you can do a twist test. It's not scientific, but it's something farmers have been using for decades. <coughs> Excuse me. You can take some of that long stem forage, put a clump in your hand, and twist those stems. If those stems break, it usually means that enough moisture has gone out of those stems and is usually sufficiently dry to bale. Now, if those stems wrap, it means that there's too much moisture in those stems and you need to let it dry longer. Now, if you have baled hay and you're purchasing it, ask for a forage analysis. It will tell you the dry matter content um, of that hay. Now, of course, the analysis is only as good as a sample you submit. But again, hopefully before you buy a large lot of hay, you will be able to see that forage analysis and see what the moisture is. You also want to know what's in the hay. If you look at this picture here, you can see that it's primarily grass hay. I actually see a lot of Timothy heads. So I know that this is grass hay. Um, you know, why does it matter whether it's grass or alfalfa? Uh, grass, if you look at grass and alfalfa at the same stage of maturity, grass hay tends to have um, less protein and more fiber compared to alfalfa. Both alfalfa and grass are great options for hay for horses, but it's just important to know what's in the hay. Also, if you can tell what is in the hay, whether it's grass or alfalfa, you can then also start to look at things that shouldn't be in the hay. We've talked about poisonous plants before, and that um, webinar is archived on the My Horse University website. So if it's not grass and it's not alfalfa or clover, it's likely something that shouldn't be in there. And I kind of touched on maturity. Um, maturity is the single biggest indicator of forage quality. Again, if you look at this picture here, you can see heads. This is a Timothy head. It doesn't mean that the hay is good or bad. It just means that the Timothy is more mature. Quite honestly, most of our horses are being overfed. Um, we just did a large project last weekend where we weighed and body condition scored 679 horses. A vast majority of those horses um, had a body condition score that put them in the fleshy or fat category. This type of mature hay that you're seeing in this picture is fantastic for a lot of our adult idle horses or horses that are maybe recreationally ridden on a trail right on the weekends or a couple evenings a week. This will also help your pocketbook. Usually this forage is a little bit lower in quality, lower in protein, and dairy producers, for example, are not going to go after this hay, so the price should be more affordable for us horse owners. The next thing is make sure to touch it and smell it. Does it smell sweet? Is it soft to the touch? If you stick your hand in a bale and you pull it out and it is full of stickers and burrs and thistles, I guarantee your horse is going to have a hard time eating it. Horses, noses, and gums, and tongues are very, very sensitive. And the one thing, especially this year, um, with a lot of the rain that we've had in the upper Midwest, Look at the outside of this bale of hay here. You can see that it's lightly bleached in color. Now, if you didn't investigate this bale and pull it open and see that the inside was bright green, you might turn away from this bale. You know, color is not a good indicator of forage quality. Hay that is bleached, like in this picture here, maybe this bale was sitting in front of the window, or maybe this bale had more exposure to sunlight. If the entire bale is lighter or golden in color, it just means that it took longer to dry in the field. Maybe it had some rain on it. But in all honesty, as long as it was adequately dried and put up well, there's nothing wrong with hay that has a little bit of a bleached color. 
In fact, those of you going after low-carb hay, hay that has taken a long time to dry and hay that has had a little bit of rain on it is perfect for you. And then a couple other things. I think common sense, make sure the bale is free of mold and weeds. And also make sure to buy a nice, dense, nice, dense well-formed bale. So this is my kind of take-home message on buying quality hay. Know the moisture content. Know what is in the hay. More importantly, so you can know what shouldn't be in there, as in the case of weeds. Know the maturity. Look for heads, as in this picture right here. Does it have a nice smell? Is it soft? Do not get too hung up on the color. It doesn't really matter in a lot of cases. And make sure to buy nice, dense bales that are well formed. So does anybody have any questions on just what to look for when you buy or grow hay? All right, well if you think of some as we go on, just type them on in. So the other area where we see um, people having a lot of waste is in the storage. You can see at this picture here, these bales happen to be stored inside. You can see that they're stored on a pallet so that rain and other ground moisture does not seep into that bale. When they're stored inside, you can stack them like a soup can. That's fine. When you store them outside, you would never want to stack them like this because too much rainfall would be able to get down. You'd want to store them in a sausage or you want to turn them on the other side. So again, these bales are stored inside. If they're stored inside, if you have a horrible roof that has a ton of leaks in it, you might as well put them outside. So make sure the roof is watertight. It's also really important to make sure to animal proof the area. This can be really, really hard, um, but just try your best. Not only do certain animals carry diseases that horses are susceptible to, like possums, um, you know, rats and mice and small rodents and even feral cats, for that matter, can make a huge mess out of hay simply by chewing the strings and flinging the hay all over the ground. So again, just make sure that the roof is watertight. You really want to make sure to use your older hay first. Um, sometimes you have, you know, those 25 bales that are sitting in the back. Your new hay is coming. You're tired. You got late at work. You need to take the time, pull that old hay to the front, and put your new crop hay in the back. Now, in a perfect world, hay can actually last indefinitely if it is baled at the proper moisture and stored under the cover. However, just with our changing seasons and humidity and water fluctuations, we like to see people use their hay supply up in two years. And in all honesty, most people do not have the luxury of sitting on hay for, you know, for two years. But again, it's just a good idea to use that older hay first and don't keep burying it in the back of the barn. Like this photo shows here, stack your hay on pallets. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times it's really nice. Uh, businesses that sell big bats of insulation. This is actually a four by eight foot pallet. You can stack a lot of hay on these pallets. So try to find a company that wants to get rid of their pallets and um, put your hay on that pallet. So we have a question here. Your opinion on storing hay on top of rows of hay baled inside on pallets. So my opinion on storing hay on top of a row of hay bales inside on the pallets. Dave, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, maybe you can clarify that. It's kind of late at night for me here, so I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not getting it. But just clarify that, and I'll try to answer. You know, store that hay inside if possible. I know not everyone has the luxury of having inside hay storage. If you do not have inside hay storage, try to tarp the bales. Um, a bad tarp job is better than no tarp job at all. It is important, though, to make sure that the tarp is securely flashened so you don't have the flapping tarps, the tarps that blow on and off, because the last thing you want to do is trap moisture between the tarp and the bale. Okay, so Dave, instead of using pallets, we use small square bales as our base to keep our hay off the ground. You know what, Dave? A lot of people actually use that. 
Um, we call that bunking hay. So if you have some hay that is not the best quality, you can set that on the ground inside of your pallets. And just know that that bottom row will get that inch or two of kind of crusty mold on it just from the ground moisture. But if that is the roll of those bales and you can sacrifice, you know, those bottom bales, that's also a good option. You can probably reuse those bales, um, you know, as your base bales for a couple of years as well. So Susan says, my local feed store gave me a ton of pallets or a local landscaping company will gladly for someone to take the pallets off their hands. And Susan, I, I agree that is what I have observed as well. Um, there are certain businesses who will gladly give um, their pallets away. So Sandra has a question. We have a metal container that gets very hot inside in the summer. Is it bad for the hay to be stored in the heat of the container? Um, Sandra, that's a really great question. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people making is they take some hay that has been baled well and they shove it and kick it with all their might into a teeny tiny box stall with no airflow and no ventilation and they shut the door. Even if that hay is baled at the proper moisture, just with our humidity levels, especially this past year, the hot, humid summer that we have, we have seen some hay that has just become dusty. So I think, Sandra, if you know you're going to get into a hot stretch, cracking the bottom of that metal container or maybe cutting a hole in the side and putting in a fan, like a damper fan, um, that can help circulate the air is a great investment. Um, hay does need to breathe. Even hay that is dried well at 15% moisture, it still needs a little bit of room to breathe. So again, kind of cracking that container during really, really hot spells and or even maybe cutting a hole in the side and putting some dampers or putting in a fan to help circulate the air, I think that would be a great idea. So Helen has a question. Are rectangular or square bales ideally stored in central air conditioning? Um, you know, with storing hay, if you have a climate-controlled area, where the temperature and almost more importantly the humidity stays consistent, that is a great idea. I don't know many people that have that luxury, but if you have a luxury to keep the temperature and humidity consistent for your hay, I would take advantage of that. Now, one thing we do not want you to do is store large quantities of hay inside your barn. And my thought process is if maybe your barn is temperature controlled, um, Insurance companies really get nervous with large quantities of hay for fire purposes stored with livestock. Preferably, we'd rather see a separate building and then maybe just your daily or a handful of day supply of hay brought into the barn. All right, you guys are, at, are, are answering great or asking great, great questions. So just to kind of demonstrate how important it is to limit waste during storage. Here is some great research that was done in Kentucky, and it was done with round bales. So here we have um, a four foot by four foot round bales. A four by five round bale, I think, is your everyday round bale that weighs 800 to 1,000 pounds. What they did is they left these bales sit outside. Here is the amount of waste, two inches of waste, four, six, and eight inches of, of waste along the outside layer. And if you think about a round bale, most of the hay is in that outer circle because of the, just because of how a, a circle or a cylinder is constructed. So if we look at six inches of waste, and if you think about six inches of waste, I'm sure you've seen round bales that have had that much waste from sitting outside, you know, for the summer. With these four by five round bales, that is over a third of your hay. So again, with these large round bales, make sure to tarp them or store them inside or you could be losing, you know, up to as much as a third of your hay. Um, small square bales, large square bales, large round bales. Again, really important to store them inside or at least to tarp them or get them under cover um, if you're storing them outside. So before we go on to feeding, does anybody have any additional questions on buying hay or storing hay? And again, you guys can ask these as you think of them as well.
So there was some research done um, a few years ago, and it looked at feeding in a box stall. A lot of people maybe keep their horses in at night, or they have show barns where their horses are housed um, in a box stall for a majority part of the day. Um, they looked at feeding small square bales off the ground and in a feeder. When they looked at feeding these small square bales off the ground, there was about 7% waste compared to um, under, you know, right around 1% waste when the hay was fed in some type of a feeder. And here's just an example of a feeder. You know, it doesn't matter if it's this type of a feeder or if it's a feeder um, on the ground, maybe in the corner that just keeps the hay contained. Basically, what you want to do in a box stall setting is just make sure that the horses cannot trample, defecate, or urinate on that hay. Now, I know some people get worried about feeding their horses up high because of, of, of dental issues, and there's definitely merit to that. So if you could feed the horses slightly elevated off the ground, um, but kind of near ground level, that's probably best. But again, any type of box stall feeder that would just contain the hay so the horses don't string it across their feeder or across their stall, step on it, and defecate on it. So we looked at this data here with the small square bales, and we started looking around Minnesota and um, in the upper Midwest, and we were seeing that a lot of people were, were feeding round bales. And when we were talking to horse owners about that, one of their complaints was is that their horses were overeating and that they had excessive waste from their round bales. However, people were feeding these round bales because they were cheaper on a per ton basis. So these round bales were perceived as being more affordable to the horse owners. However, we heard a lot of horse owners say, you know what, we can afford these cheaper round bales, but we just can't afford a feeder. And that kind of got us thinking. And uh, one of our, so that kind of led us to a research project. Um, and that project was to really look at different round bale feeder designs and to see if those round bale feeders affected hay waste, horse intake, and economics. And this is one of my favorite pictures that I actually found online. And I think this just pretty much tells it. You know, here are these two little ponies. One is obviously quite overweight. And this round bale is kind of like their shelter and their feed. But if you think about that, think about how much waste is potentially in that system. So what we set out to do is we use 50 four by five first crop orchard grass round bales. Um, before the study, you can see in this picture here, we weighed each of the round bales, we cored them for quality, and then we stored them inside until they were fed. This round bale here of orchard grass hay, um, they weighed about 883 pounds on average. So again, this is your pretty typical upper Midwestern grass, cool season grass round bale. It was first cutting, there were heads, it was mature, but the horses we were feeding, their only job during the summer was to eat hay. They were not in an exercise program, they were not lactating, they were not showing, they were not breeding. So again, this was perfect hay, um, you know, for, for, for these horses. So uh, Anne has a question. Do mesh bag style hay feeders that are supposed to slow down consumption hold up to use? Afraid of horses tearing up and swallowing some of the mesh. Well, Anne, um, we'll talk a little bit about a mesh type product we evaluated for the round bales. But interestingly enough, this winter, we are doing a study to address your question. Um, we're going to be looking at small square bale feeding in, in box stalls, and we're going to be looking at some of the mesh feeders to see if they actually do slow down consumption. You know, the whole slow feeding, um, kind of trying to duplicate grazing. Um, but at this point, we don't really know the answers, but hopefully in a year from now, we'll have those answers for you. <coughs> Excuse me. We used 25 mature quarter horses and geldings to eat off of this hay. The horses were weighed um, at the very start of the project. They were weighed every time they changed pens or changed feeders, and then, of course, at the end. So we knew exactly what the horses weighed when they went into the pens and when they came out. 
and in each pen we had a single feeder that was placed on the ground in an outdoor dirt paddock. We really wanted to duplicate what we see as you know common practices in the horse industry. So Susan has a comment that says, I have used hay bags for years and none have been torn up. They do help with keeping hay off the ground. That's good to know, thank you. So this is what our setup looked like. So we had our five pens, and remember we tested um, 10 feeders in all, nine feeders and a no feeder control. So we tested the original five for 20 days, and then we removed the feeders and put in um, the, the next four feeders and a no feeder control. So every day, hay that fell on the ground, it had to be on the ground and not touching the feeder, was considered waste and it was collected. And then again, after four days, the herds of five horses each were rotated to a new paddock containing a different feeder with a new round bale of hay. <laughs> We've had a lot of people ask us, why do we choose five horses? And I think if you're going to feed round bales in an outdoor setting, it is really important to have a sufficient number of horses. If you just had one or two horses and you had a round bale feeder that was outside, I'm not sure a round bale would be a good choice for you simply because it will take your horse too long to consume that bale and that bale is, you know, is then more adverse to being affected by, by weather, rainfall, humidity, snow, whatever. Now, if you use a cover feeder or maybe you um, put the round bale feeder in a shed, that's a different story. But most people do not feed their round bales indoors. So again, think about your own setup. You know, round bales do tend to be more affordable on a per ton basis compared to other hay types. But if you do not have enough horses to efficiently eat that hay, I think you'll be disappointed. And maybe you can use that as a... Uh, as a way to encourage your spouse that you need more horses. So we, so like I said, we tested nine different round bale feeders and a no feeder control. And I have um, nice pictures to show this. Um, this was a grant that was um, uh, sponsored by our Minnesota Horse Council. So you can see a definite Minnesota um, emphasis, but we did have feeders from all over the country. We also um, and companies uh, that help sponsor the project with fees as well. So here's a picture of the different feeders, and you can see they're all quite different. Um, this feeder here is a hay hut. How you get the hay in is you just tip it back. It's actually quite uh, light. You set the bale in, and then you tip the feeder back down. It has eight of these little storage windows that, that the horses are allowed to eat off of. This red feeder right here is what we call the covered cradle. You can see the hay is cradled up off the ground and it's covered. The other interesting thing is that right here it has collapsible sides. So if you wanted to restrict access at some point you could put the sides up. But what we did is we just allowed the sides to rest on the bale and as the horses ate the hay down the sides collapsed. This feeder was called the hay sleigh. Basically it just held the hay up off the ground. This next feeder was called the wasteless feeder. These doors right here opened and you slid the bale inside. Like the red covered feeder, this one has a little crank where the side panels go down onto the hay. So again, if you wanted to restrict access to the horses, you could do that. What we did is we made sure that the sides were touching the bale at nine o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock at night. Our objective was not to restrict the hay, uh, access to the hay, we wanted to ensure that the horses always had access. Um, this right here is called the cinch net, and this maybe gets to a little bit about that mesh style of feeder that you guys are talking about. They do make a similar feeder for small square bales, but again, it looks like a fishing net. You throw it over the bale and then you cinch it tight at the bottom. This, of course, is our no feeder control, no, round, no feed around it. This next feeder is called a cone feeder. There is an inverted cone in the middle of this feeder that holds it up. And then you can see the horses eat with these slots. This feeder here is just called a ring feeder. And it's just a solid poly ring. Um, this feeder right here um, is called a tombstone because these um, tombstones 
are um, what well, give it its name. And of course, the horses eat in between. And finally, this is called the tombstone saver. It's basically kind of a variation of the tombstone. You can see the, the little fingers are pushed in and kind of angled up. So if you guys had to guess, and you can write it in your chat, which feeder do you think? I'll just give you, I'll count to 10 and see what you guys think. Kind of a fun little quiz. What feeder do you think was the most efficient? Number two, the big red one, the net, the hay hut, the hut, the red one, the, the hay hut. Okay, so the net and the hay hut and the big red feeder are the ones that people are kind of thinking. So when we look at the data, so here's our data. Here we have the waste, here we have the cost of the feeder, and then return on investment. And I'll explain how we got these numbers. So remember the waste. This is the amount of hay that we collected every single day. The hay had to be uh, outside of the feeder on the ground. We also dried all of this hay to 15% moisture. And because we know the ideal hay moisture is 15%, that's why we chose that moisture. So the waste less feeder, that was the white one. Um, with the doors that open with those collapsible sides that you crank down, 5% waste. The net, 6%. And what these little A's and B's mean, that even though the waste less and the cinch numerically are different, because they share this superscriptive A, statistically, they were the same. So these were kind of our top feeders. The hay hut, the green one, had 9% in waste, but again, statistically similar to the net. The covered cradle, that big red one, had 11%. Then interestingly enough, we get into our circular feeders. Um, the tombstone saver, the tombstone, the inverted cone, and the ring. They were all similar. They all have these Ds with 13 to 19% waste. The hay sleigh was the feeder that was the least efficient with 33% waste. But here is the take home message. If you do not use a feeder, you are wasting over half of your hay, 57%. So all of those people that told me they could not afford a round bale feeder, but yet were choosing to feed round bales, I think I can change their mind by showing them this data. So I don't care what feeder you use, it is critically important to use a feeder to reduce your waste. I mean, 57%, you basically are throwing half of your money away. So Ashley asked a question, was weather included in the research? That's a great question. And statistically, Ashley, we looked at that, and weather did not influence our research. We did record temperature and rainfall. But again, because we raked up that hay every single day and dried it to 15%, if it rained, it didn't matter because the hay, the waste hay was dry, which was the same moisture as, as when it was fed. So that is how we got around um, the weather issue. So again, great question, but because the waste hay was dried and collected daily, we did not see weather as, as a um, influence. So cost, you can see there's a significant um, spread in the cost of these feeders. Uh, the waste less cost $1,450. The net was the most affordable at $147. <coughs> Excuse me, the hay hut was $650. That big red covered cradle was definitely the most expensive at $3,200. The tombstone saver, the brown feeder with the arms kind of pushed in, was also $650. The cone with the inverted cone was uh, $1,195. The ring was $300, and the sleigh hay was $425. Now, I want to make sure that these, this study was done last summer in 2010. Um, these prices reflect um, you know, the cost of the feeders, on June of 2010. Some of the prices may fluctuate a little bit now, but again, this was our cost last year. So we have um, some questions, and we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about these in the next slides, but is the cinch net reusable? It is reusable, but they only guarantee it for three years. 
And can a horse become entangled in the net feeder when the hay is low? Recent pictures. We did not have any problems with horses getting tangled. And I should also say with, with all of these feeders, we did not have any problems. We had no horse safety issues. Now, we tested the feeders for 40 days. We had horses that were used in a university riding program, so they tended to be pretty level-headed. We did not have foals or, you know, horses that tended to be hard to handle. But so again, for the 40 days that we tested, we had no problems with any of these feeders. Now I want to look at the economics, the return on investment. So what we did is we valued at our hay at $100 a ton. That was the going price when we did this data. Now I have seen reports of hay creeping up over $200 a ton. In that case, if your hay is $200 a ton, you can just divide these numbers in half. So how we did a return on investment, we took the cost of the feeder, we took the waste, and how much it improved itself over the no feeder control. So when we looked at that, the wasteless hay feeder repaid its cost in eight months. Um, the net, three weeks. The hay hut was four months. The covered cradle, even though it was efficient, it was a bit more expensive. That took 20 months to repay a cost. And then you can see the saver was also four months. The tombstone was two months. The cone, again, a little bit more waste, a little higher price, took nine months. The ring, two months. And the hay slay, five months. So again, I realize it is an investment and finances are tight. But if you're going to feed round bales, you have to use a feeder. And depending on how much you want to invest, I guarantee you will get that investment back. It just depends on how long it takes to get that investment back. Ooh, somebody's getting themselves a hay feeder. I like to hear that. So let's take a closer look at these feeders. So here you can see is one of the students that helped us, Kayla. And this is the crank where she is cranking down um, that feeder. And um, you can see here, you can see this is when it's all the way down. Now, this feeder, um, we, we had a few little tiny issues with it. These sidebars are relatively close together. And because of that, some of the horses had small cosmetic rub marks on the sides of their faces. Now, for some horse owners, that's not a problem. Other horse owners, that absolutely is not acceptable. So you need to be aware of that. The other issue is it really has feeding spots for four horses, two on this side, two on that side. We did have the boss mare in one pen, and she patrolled that area. So if you do have some very, very bossy horses, um, you might want to be cautious of the amount of feeding time each horse gets. But as you can see, there is not a lot of waste hay on the outside of this feeder. So let's look at um, some questions. Where can the net be purchased? I've never seen one before. All of these feeders have websites. And if you want to go back and look when I included that, um, the, the cinch net, if you just do a Google search for cinch net or cinch chicks, you will find that feeder. Does, this, does the net slow down the horse's eating? We do not know the answer to that question, but again, we're going to investigate that with small square bales this winter. I did not show the horse weight or the pen weight gain data. There was really no difference. All the horses consumed about 2.4, somewhere in there, percent of their body weight, with one exception, which I will get to. Um, but again, um, you know, I, I can't answer the question if the net slows it down. We, we, we don't know that answer yet. Which feeder would be safe for weanlings? You know, we only tested these with adult horses, but again, we had no horse safety issues with adult horses. Um, your question specifically asks um, your feet, you know, your question specifically asks about weanlings. We, we didn't test them with, with weanlings, but again, we saw no horse safety issues um, with any of the feeders. All right, so again, one thing to be concerned about for this net is use it with another feeder as our recommendation. Although we did not use it that way, we have heard, you know, success stories from others. Here's a hay hut, and looking back to the questions, 
Um, one person, um, so we had a couple questions about this. In the hay hut, let's see, the hay hut, there's a question back here about mycotoxins. I think that's important to address. Um, I've heard some people say you can't bail good quality round bales, and I would really disagree with that. If your round bales are 15% moisture or less, they will be good quality round bales. Now, anytime you're feeding a round bale, you have the possibility of having exposure to molds and like that's with any kind of hay. But with the hay hut, they did bale, but they also bale with other types of feeders. Boiling just means that basically they put their nose directly into that hay and they would breathe in any kind of dust or mold. But again, that is not a problem with the feeders. That is a problem with the quality of hay. And you should be watching, especially watch the moisture content um, on that hay. So one person asked me, did we have this problem? Um, yes. This is actually a picture from our trial after a heavy rain. And we had to dig all this hay out and dry it. When we weighed it, it wasn't that much hay. This was included in our waste measurements. Um, so again, this is a problem that we experienced, and thus that recommendation of using it in combination. Um, somebody asked if the hay hut is um, too light, can the wind blow it away? No. I actually wondered about that, but we never had any issues with the feeder blowing away. So again, any other questions about the hay hut? Um, and as you can see, if you look around the outside of these more efficient feeders, there isn't a lot of hay waste that we can see. Next was the covered cradle, and again, this one was, was efficient, similar to the hay hut, and you can see here how, oops, you guys can see here how these um, sides collapse down, and again, if you wanted to restrict access, you can actually put these back up, and I think I just showed here, it's just a little bit of a lever that you can pull. So again, if you look around at this um, feeder, there isn't a lot of waste. It's efficient. It also keeps the hay up and off the ground. This is a tombstone saver. Remember those circular feeders, the ones we're going to see here next, they have between 13 and 19 percent waste. And I think you can see the amount of hay on the ground outside of the feeder is more than what we've seen with the previous um, photo. So again, the photo on your left is what it looked like on day one. And here's what that feeder looked like on subsequent days. In a similar story with that tombstone feeder. You can see on day one, we put the bale in, it was nice and clean. And then, of course, every day we had, you know, quite a bit of hay um, to waste uh, or wasted hay to rake up. And, you know, some of these horses were just absolute slobs. We would watch them. They would grab a milk full of hay, turn around, drop it on the ground, and then go back for more. Um, so it's one of those things where that's kind of the nature of horses, and we try our hardest. Uh, but again, even having a feeder that is less efficient for waste is still a much better option than not using a feeder at all. And this is that cone feeder. Again, it's that inverted cone where you can see the hay is held up. And um, you can see the amount of waste outside of this feeder. Uh, now, just one word of caution, they do make a feeder, uh, a comb feeder for beef cattle. It is two feet shorter, so that top skirt is two feet shorter. And um, the problem with that is if this, the top skirt is shorter, you're likely going to see some mane rubbing. So if you're interested in the comb feeder, make sure that you get one that is made for horses so you have sufficient clearance um, so you don't have mane rubbing. Now, the issue with these big, tall feeders is you got to get that hay, you kind of got to toss it up there with your skid loader or tractor. So um, it is a pretty tall feeder. And next is a solid poly ring feeder. <coughs> Excuse me. These are really popular. Um, we've seen them a lot. But again, you can see that 19% hay waste that is around the base of that feeder. And then our least efficient feeder, but again, a feeder that was still better than. Um, um, then the no feeder control is a hay slay. On a positive, it did keep the hay up off the ground, but it almost kind of served it to them on a golden platter. And you can see the gobs and gobs of hay that these horses pulled out. 
Now, people have asked us, do you think if we would have left the hay, do you think the horses would have eaten it off the ground? Um, when we observed these horses, they would always go for hay that was in the feeder. So all of this hay here that is actually edible, by the time they stood around and ate hay out of the feeder, they would tromp this into the dirt. They would urinate and defecate on it. So even though it appears to be ed edible, um, they always would choose to eat hay out of the feeder. And then, of course, this is our no feeder control. <coughs> Excuse me. On days one and two, it was circular. But on days three and four, you can see that these horses absolutely destroyed that bale. And on these days, anything that wasn't, you know, anything that had urine or had been defecated on or was tromped in the ground, um, we considered waste. Interestingly enough, the no feeder control was the only treatment that resulted in horses losing weight. And that is because on that fourth day, there was so much waste that the horses probably did not have a ton to eat. And what we were seeing was probably just a decrease in weight because their guts were not full. And obviously, that's something that we really, really want to be careful of. Um, you know, with forcing horses to eat hay that has obviously been soiled for cow purposes, um, horses with heaves and things like that. So again, 57% waste with this no feeder control. So just to kind of summarize um, the, the data, um, the feeder design does affect hay waste and economics. All of the feeders resulted in less waste compared to the no feeder control. The horse owners, you know, the horse owners that feed round bales, you cannot afford to not use a feeder. You have to use some type of feeder. And I know it's an investment, but the investment pays off. All of these feeders pay for themselves within two years in most of them within nine months. So just to recap, ways to reduce waste, especially when hay is going to be expensive. All indicators tell us that hay is going to be more expensive going into this winter. Buy quality hay. Make sure it is free of dust and mold. Make sure the moisture content is adequate. It doesn't matter if it's slightly bleached. It doesn't matter if it's mature hay. It just needs to be clean hay meaning free of weeds, dust, and mold. Store the hay properly. Try to put it inside if you can. If not, really securely fasten that tarp. Um, you know, use the older hay first. And really be aware of waste with storage. And then finally, use a feeder. Whether you are feeding small square bales in a box stall, or whether you are feeding round bales um, outside. I don't care what you use, but you need to use a feeder. So I think we have a couple questions here, and you guys can keep the questions um, coming. And uh, Sandra has a question. I have seen our horses eat any hay that they have dropped out of the feeders. Oh, she has never seen her horses eat any hay they dropped out of the feeders. And that's what we observed last summer with this trial. I don't know why they didn't eat it, maybe just to frustrate us, but they definitely would only eat the hay that was in the feeder. Um, Stephanie, I live in the Northeast and we use square bales. Does anyone make a square bale feeder that keeps hay up off the ground? Um, yes, actually that big red feeder, the covered cradle feeder, um, that was $3,200, that feeder can fit one big square bale in it and it does keep the feeder off the ground. And I have seen other variations of square, big square bales feeders that also keeps the hay up off the ground. You might just have to do an internet search. And again, we did not specifically investigate, you know, big square bales. But I would assume, um, you know, that the results would be similar. And really, if you look at this data, any of the round bale feeders that restricted access to some point resulted in a little bit less waste. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, Christina, Tractor Supply sells two different types of square bale feeders for outside that are freestanding. Um, Kim, any tricks for keeping horses out of the tombstone type feeders? We had two serious injuries last winter when they crawled into it. Uh, you know, Kim, we have heard of that. Definitely, we, we see um, horses that have had injuries from a variety of things at our clinic. Um, but again, I, I don't know any tricks. I thankfully have never personally had a horse that's jumped into the feeder, and we didn't experience that at all. 
When we've shown this data to other people that have horses that are more accident prone, they actually um, thought that they liked that ring feeder. Even though it had 19% waste, they thought that if the horses jumped in, they could easily jump out. So I don't know any tricks off the top of my, off the top of my head, and it's, uh, it's, it's too bad that you've had those serious injuries. Helen, are you familiar with any easy drop stall, floor stall devices that would limit the waste for install use? Um, Helen, we haven't tested anything like that, and I'm, I'm not kind of up to speed on that yet, but uh, again, that is something that we're really looking forward to looking um, more into um, this coming winter. And I can see that a bunch of you are typing away, so I will patiently await your questions. All right, well, you know what, I really, I, I, I don't know why we have the microphone problems, but leave it to Amanda, our, our technology wizard, she solved the problem. I appreciate you guys sticking it out with me and, um, you know, uh, kind of hanging in there where we got that microphone fixed. And I apologize if that took away from the presentation, um, but I, uh, I really appreciate you spending the evening with me. So with that, I will turn it um, back over to Amanda. Yep, I'm still here. Oh. Got it. 